doesn't have a seat, um, which you can use to totally utilize these little benches on the side. Um, there's another seat right here, a little seat here, over here. This is taken and forget it. Um, and we, we have uh, motel ca motels coming down, so if somebody doesn't have a place to sit, we'll take care of that in just um, brief, two, two brief moments, okay? But it seems like we're fine. Okay. Um, hello everyone, welcome to those of you who have been here before, welcome back. To those of you who, who for whom is it the first time at the Center for Jewish History, do we have, okay good, okay, welcome. So it's a little confusing, I'll give you a brief uh, introduction. My name is Shirley Bacham, the Director of Public Programs at the American Jewish Historical Society here at the Center for Jewish History, here in this building. The AJHS is actually just one of five different partner organizations. So we have uh, the Leo Beck Institute here, the Jewish uh, German Archive, the ASF, the American Sephardi Federation. We have uh, the Shiva University Museums, the gallery is right here. And we have EVO, which is the Yiddish Institute for Research. Five. So um, we're very, very happy, the AJHS, to Welcome for tonight's program, Amy Fox and Elizabeth Fox here for this staged reading. And thank you for joining us and thank you for uh, preparing this program with us. Um, so just to uh, tell you a little bit about the AJHS and why actually do we want to do a program like this here. So um, people tend to forget or um, Maybe some people don't even know, but this building, this beautiful space right here is actually attached to floors of, of many, many stacks of archival materials. The AJHS uh, is the oldest ethnic um, archive in this country and largest, actually. We were founded in 1892, and the archive comprises of over 30 million documents, manuscripts, photographs, many of which you can actually access online digitally. Um, so this is how uh, our collections look like from the inside. Yes, um, the, and this is right here, right upstairs. And this collection specifically that I'm showing you is the National Jewish Welfare Board collection that has a lot of records from World War II. Um, right, so a direct link to why this is so important and so great to host this stage reading here. Um, and here's a closer look. This is the military chaplaincy records. We have photographs. Again, you can access them online and 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 use them. And and, and they're, they're really great. They're really um, um, original and, and and very fascinating. War cards are from the Bureau of War Records, so a lot of very private details of the actual the soldiers who participated in uh, the wars in the, uh, from the U.S. military. Yeah, so uh, this is just to get you all excited about if you want to come here and attend the, the reading room, the library, and do some research, maybe about your family, maybe about anything that interests you, you should come for that too, as well as our program, of course. Um, and for tonight's program, um, I'm going to give you a little run of the show. We're going to have a stage reading here with two uh, phenomenal actors that Amy will introduce in a second. This is going to last about 45 minutes. And then we'll sit down for Q&A uh, with Liz Fox, who wrote the book, who edited the book. We're going to be lucky based on the letters of her parents. And Amy, who produced this stage reading, is in, he is a producer on her part. And with, the, um, with one of the actors, with David, who's going to stay with us. Um, and, um, and then we'll have Q&A, and then you can take some um, refreshments and, and stay and hang out and ask more questions. Um, okay, so with no further ado, Amy Fox, please, take you. Thanks you all. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, as long as we had the letters in the family, originally my mom would ask me if I would 
ready to play. Or I was ready to play. And I kept saying those years ago, I kept saying, I don't think they need to be a player's team, but I just think they need to be read as they, as they are. So this is the closest I came was putting together the script for tonight. Um, I want to introduce two friends of mine and wonderful actors, um, David Allen Bache and Cynthia Van Hasselberg. Um, so if you guys want to come on up, um, I know them both. Well, I know them both. They, they, I was so fortunate to have them in the film I wrote called Equity. Uh, you may have seen David on the TV show. Sophie's got a new show coming up, American Princess, right? Um, and so we're really thrilled that they could be here tonight to bring my grandparents to life. This is sort of surreal. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to let them get started. Hi, hi everybody. Hi. Hi. May 1943. Landing sets off. I was just going to project this a little bit. Okay. Uh, May 1943. Landing sets off a basic training at Camp Shelby, Mississippi, while Diana pursues her work at the Brooklyn Navy Yard building periscopes for the Navy and organizing for the Union. May 16th. Lenny Darwin, your phone call this morning still has me smiling every few minutes. How I love to hear your voice. How do you look in your uniform? You must look so handsome. Darling, now that I am all settled in my mother's house, I have gotten a lot of new things, bed, chest, and closet, but the house looks a little like a storage place. My parents are very good-natured about it, though. Sleep well tonight, and my arms will be around you, and my love will be with you. Diana. May 20, Fulton, Kentucky. Beloved, we're south of the Mason-Dixon line now, and I still don't know where to, but now it's south. Got my first sight of cotton bales. Well, darling, I have now loved you in 10 states in 48 hours. <laughs> and in some for the first time. Well, it's Mississippi for sure, and most likely Shelby. I expect to get my address in the morning. Lynn. June 5. My dearest, last night when I fell in with my company and the regiment, with several others, marched out at twilight. We walked in silence because we were practicing a forced march approaching enemy lines. Think, if you can, of long column on column of young men in green uniforms, green helmets, brown faces, and brown rifles, alongside of the green blending into the forest we were entering. The guys suffered from heat and sweat, from dust and thirst, from fatigue and nausea, from every kind of ache and pain, but they felt it. Now we are becoming soldiers. This is the real test, not those right faces and left faces. They felt they must come through now, even if they had failed before. For all the lack of discussion of war aims, everyone knows the score, if it, even if it isn't expressed. We are in for a battle. Lenny. June 9th. Sweetheart, perhaps I have not been expressing in my letters, but I understand the tough training you have. Of course, I know there is no comparison, but my job in New York takes almost all my strength out of me. Lenny, I wrote of the terrific hostel we had. I know I cannot write descriptions like you can, but as I worked, the sweat pouring from my body, I was so wet and hot that before long, I noticed my arms and face and neck becoming a distinct green. I was frightened, but some of the men told me that always happens in the summer. The grass we work with reacts with the acids in the skin and leaves a distinct green covering. I now stand all day long because I am on a new machine, which is so high that it is impossible to sit. In spite of this, I go on day after day because my fighting spirit and my determination make me do my job. Diane. June 10th. Dearest, I saw a very cute cartoon. A woman with a baby in her arms says to another woman pointing to the baby. We call him furlough. Well, when I come to you, I will bring my equipment so that we won't have a furlough unless we decide to. <laughs> Yours, Diane. July 22. My dear girl, brave lass, thanks again for your words of encouragement and comfort. You're a real mate and I'm proud of you. 
you've done a darn sight more than more these three months gone at your job and other duties towards winning the war than I am. Though I'm in training, and as a soldier, I get all the glory. August 9, my dearest, there's a heavy rainstorm pouring down and we'll likely not have to retreat. Don't worry about when you see me next. My attitude is that we'll meet again when victory is won and any chance to get together before is pure luck and we are going to be lucky. Lenny. August 24th. Sweetheart, Lenny Darling. When you write about jungle tactics that you are learning and how you are learning to get along in the jungle, I get a little concerned because those are things which I know nothing about. Perhaps I should start getting used to climbing trees and hills and crossing creeks, because as you know, I am not good at those things, and you might want to continue this even when victory is ours and you come home. My Tarzan husband may require a jungle mate. Diana. <laughs> September 13th. Lenny dear, there was a great deal of festivity in New York with the Italian surrender. Terrific doings on Mulberry Street in Little Italy. Demonstrations, street corner rallies. In the afternoon when the news came through, the garment center was like Times Square on New Year's Eve from what I heard. On Thursday night, there was a victory rally at Madison Square Garden. There was a lot of hubbub in the city, but it died down quickly. I think people realized after the first excitement that the war is still not won. Diana. September 21 for October 2. My love. <laughs> <laughs> you have yourself? No, no. My love. When you read these lines, three full months will have passed since I kissed you and bade you goodbye at the guest house terrace. As I have said often, when the guys here need prodding, we want the war to end with victory soon, but we'd hate not to get our lick at bat. To get an early chance up at bat and help in the final push, that would be swell. Lenny. September 30th. Dearest love, the company has definitely discovered that people are joining the union, and I think they also know who started it. Their main strategy has been to frighten a few of us and also to scare the others away from us. They have not come out in a frontal attack yet, but last Tuesday, my assistant foreman called me over and said in a very angry voice, I hear you are going to join the union. Since I didn't want to commit myself either way to him, I just said, I'm thinking about it. Then he went into a 15 to 20 minute attack against unions. When he finished, I wanted him to know he hadn't frightened me, so I said, I'm still thinking about it. And I walked away. Your Diana. October 16th. Lenny, darling, I have been thinking a great deal about the question you asked regarding having a baby. I still feel in the main way, in the main, the way I did before. I want to have a baby very, very much, but I think the reasons for not having it begin to take precedence, although I have not fully decided yet. The main reason is I'm afraid to take on the responsibility alone. If I felt confident I could manage physically, I wouldn't hesitate a minute. Also, dearest, if we should have to be apart for a number of years, I don't feel I could care for a child and work also, and financially I would have to after the first year or so. But darling, in spite of all I have written, I do so want to have a baby. I hope you understand what I mean. Write me what you think, Diana. <coughs> October 18 for next Sunday, October 24. Dearest beloved, though I fear almost to write it, lest snafu bring grief, when you get this, I'll be almost ready to take off on furlough. I can't wait. Lenny. <laughs> October 20. Dearest Lenny, by the time this reaches you, you will be almost on your way. I hope, oh, I hope. You don't say when I can expect you, although you did write your schedule for October 26th, next Tuesday. Thank you. Lenny and Diana spent almost two weeks together in New York during his furlough. November 9, en route. Darling Diana, tomorrow I'm back at work. I want to clear my deck for action. It's not good to carry a mind full of fresh furlough memories into camp. I, I, don't, I don't want to forget them. No, I don't. But one needs to distill them, digest them, extract the fighting moral, morale essence, and store the rest safely for future times. Lenny. November 10th. Dear Lenny, dearest, I thought of the past two weeks and all that happened. I'm really so glad we had this opportunity to be together and that we took advantage of it to make a most important decision. I feel fine. In fact, too well because I've been taking it easily. I wish the next week will pass quickly so I can go to the doctor and really know. Your Diana. November 12th. Sweetheart, I was at my shop this afternoon and I quit. 
I didn't have any trouble at all. I was really sorry to leave because I was proud of that job. I was so happy to be able to say I was a war worker. But I hope my new job will be even better and certainly as important. Gosh, this letter is all about me. Uh, write me what's happening in camp, Diane. November 14 for Sunday, November 21. Darling, sitting in the USO at Laurel, waiting for the bus, and I am flabbergasted for once on what to write you. What does one write to a pregnant wife? <laughs> I know I should have studied your Hunter College prenatal care course. It's still so new, and you being back at home so that I missed the show put an awful strain on the imagination. You have all my love and best wishes for an easy time of it. Gee, I do so hope and pray so. <laughs> November 16, postcard. Dearest, on the bivouac, no stationery, only postcards available. It's cold, but I'm in those laughable but very warm sweater and long johns, knitted by B that are so long they reach from my torso to my feet. <laughs> December 6, for Sunday, December 12, darling wife, this is the third time I have begun this letter, and both previous times I couldn't write. It seemed there was something I wanted to say very much, but I knew it would make you sad, and so I didn't want to say it. Dina, my beloved, my wife, my mate, my mother-to-be, there are hard jobs to do and hard things to say. But one thing I've got to say right now, it's one of those things that you can't quite explain, but like I had to love you when I did. Dina, as a soldier, I can't guarantee to keep one promise to you. Much as I'd like to, much as I'd want to, I have a feeling I've, I've promised you I'm coming back when it's all over. I've got to feel I have no such obligation, that my only obligation is to strangle the Nazi serpent before all else. Precisely in order to come back safe, I must feel free to devote all to the battle, without any hesitations, without any reservations or looking backwards. Do you understand, Diana? I do hope I haven't made you terribly unhappy. Rest assured, I'm training myself far beyond the Army's demands to be a good soldier capable of surviving any number of battles. Smile at me bravely as you did when we parted in Washington. And tell me you understand. December 12th, Sunday. Dearest Lenny, since I read your Sunday letter, I am very anxious to answer you immediately. Lenny, darling, you write you do not want to make me sad. Sad is really too shallow a word to us. My darling, if it will not be possible for you to come back to us, very frankly, right now as I write it, I can't conceive of how I will live. But I do know that this is, if this is demanded of me, I shall do my best to live. And most of all, I shall try to bring up our baby as you would do, and as you would want to be brought up. But I do hope so much that you will come back to us. We need you very much, my darling, and I know that you want to also. However, as you say, for you to come back safely, you will have to devote all of yourself to the battle, and that is as it should be. I am smiling at you as when we parted. Not a happy or a carefree smile, but a smile of understanding, love, and admiration. I hope this answer is what you wanted. If you are satisfied, then let us again put this subject away and hope that we'll never have to live through it. Diana. December 22, December 27. Dear Diana, this morning we threw real grenades. 20 ounces of concentrated death. Pull the pin and five seconds later, it's deadly shrapnel and exploding TNT, and you better have ducked. Lenny. P.S. Enclosed is the safety ring and pin from the grenade I threw today. <laughs> Aside from the curiosity value, it might be used as a novelty buckle on a belt. Not very pretty, but very meaningful. Dear parents, Diana has written me that the news of her pregnancy has caused you some concern. And therefore, I want to give you the reasons for which I think that you should be greeting Diana with joy and happiness. We have well understood what sort of burdens will fall on Tina. Despite that, we felt that we, who for so many years have been engaged in the struggle to rescue the world from Hitler barbarism, we who have sacrificed so much for this struggle, have also a right to the natural good things and joys which every person has a right to. When we came to this decision, we understood that the full responsibility was our own. From you, beloved parents, I expect this one thing, that same love which you have always shown to our Dina and me. And no doubt, Dina may come sometimes for a mother's advice. 
I want to hope that the new year, 1944, will therefore be crowned for you not only with Hitler's downfall, but also with the bright smile of your first grandchild. Lenny. December 31st. My darling, and so it is New Year's. Everyone is expecting so much from this year of 1944. We've been promised victory in Europe. Certainly we can say that 1944 will be a year of great decisions. And my darling, for you and me, 1944 will be an important year, the year that we become a family. Diana. January 10th. Dearest, I'm so very sorry that my mail to you is so irregular. I know how you feel because last week I didn't have any mail from Thursday to Monday. Please know that I'm well and I'm right. Beloved, I think of you every day, all day long, and my love should reach you even when the mail is a little delayed. Plenty. February 17. Dearest, a weary Lenny writes a day later after a day of pain and suffering which can only be exceeded by combat. Yesterday we hiked in the rain at a killing pace, soaked in sweat beneath and rain above, in mud knee deep that sucked you in and threw you down till muscles cried out for pain and the brain reeled. And when in blackness of rain and forest we ended, there was no chow, no food for 25 hours, and we just lay down in the wet grass and mud and dozed as the rain fell on us. I could go on for pages on our misery, but that's war. So it goes. I love you. Now take this business of the baby kicking. What's that all about? What's it kicking for? Tell me everything. The best reward was to have one's own feeling of satisfaction from the company commander and the operations officer when we got back. The letters I had to burn were pleasant ones about Betty's play yard, also my personal memos, which would serve to write up my record of experiences in Holland and Germany. 1944, Merry Christmas, from the 120th Infantry, somewhere in Germany. Lenny. January 6th. Dear Lenny, our Betty Lou is five months old today. Here's a birthday kiss from her and one from her mama too. We had a fine birthday today, mail from you. Darling, in the 12 slash 29 airmail, you speak of an experience which may win you the silver star. Congratulations, darling. Even if you do not actually get the decoration, your two gals are mighty proud of you. I'm sorry you cannot write me about it, but I understand. I'm sorry you had to destroy some of my letters. Were you able to keep the pictures you have? I'm most sorry that you had to destroy the notes with your experiences. When you are permitted to, will you see what you can do from memory? Diana. January 15th. Dearest, I had two emails from you today from 1228 and 12 slash 45. Yes, luck does favor us in the present, beloved. Diana. January 15th. Dearest, today I saw the evidence of one of the crimes that Germany must pay for. You'll see the photos, no doubt, in the papers. The bodies of disarmed Americans who were murdered in cold blood by German troops. <coughs> lying where they were murdered in the snow. Lenny. January 22. Dearest, no letters 120, 121. <laughs> it was a lot of war. 121, I was wounded in action, honorably, but seriously. I want this to get to you before the telegram. It took a 105 millimeter gun on a German self-propelled tank at 10 yards to get your husband. It's because I obeyed orders against my better judgment that my luck ran out. They've taken good care of me in the hospital. I have a compound fracture of leg and ankle, a hole in my left bicep arm and over my right ear, and a scratch on my right jaw. They told me that although I haven't yet got over the shock, so it's a little hard to hear, I have my left leg in a cast. In the group of six, one was killed outright, and four are missing. I will surely recover, although it is a question of time. I guess I won't see Betty soon. All my love to my girls. Writing on my back, so don't worry about the handwriting. Lenny, yes. Break the news gently to my folks. January 25, dearest, I'm really comfortably in a big modern hospital in Europe. Paris. It may take some time, but I will be okay, thanks to plasma, six pints, penicillin, about a few dozen needles, and sulfa, I seem in pretty good shape, and much less pain than I would expect, no more than when I had my tonsils up. I had one very bad moment psychologically, when they carried me in here and laid me on a real bed with sheets in a warm room. The 
realization brought back for one moment all the concentrated horrors of the past five weeks, and it was hard to bear. Sorry I won't be at the finish line, but I did a good job running intelligence for the guys carrying the ball. And don't worry, I'll be home and okay, too. Please tell the folks not to be too worried, and take care of yourself and Betty Lou. Let our friends know, as I shall not be writing much. January 30. Dearest Diana, we owe an awful lot to a buddy of mine named Elton. He was my closest friend and buddy in the squad and company all along, but especially the day I was wounded. I was lying in the dugout where I'd been hit with one other who was beyond aid, and I was figuring if I was lucky, somebody would come by the position looking for us about dark. But about 1 or 2 p.m., Elton and another came by out of their dugout way off. Elton crawled in beside me and sent the other for medics, but he never showed up. He deserted his own personal buddy in a similar case in December. Then Elton went himself and brought the medics, and although we were in a very exposed forward spot, stayed with me when the aid man left after bandaging me until the stretcher crew came. Needless to say, saving five to six hours is a life's difference. By the way, in one way, I got paid back for the time last month when I chose to help save one of our wounded who'd been abandoned by the others. That incident taught a lot of guys a lesson in comradeship. Lenny. February 5th. Dearest Lenny, I received a email from you this morning dated January 27th, 45, in which you say you were in a hospital in France. Dearest, I don't know what to think. My last mail was from January 16th, 45. I guess you've been wounded in between. You mentioned your legs, so you must be hurt there. I'm trying so hard to keep my chin up until I hear from you further. Diana. February 8th. Dearest, I think since the first time since you were in the Army, I find it difficult to write you a letter. This is the third time I've started. I've destroyed the other two. It's not that I don't know what to say. It's that I don't know how to say in words what is in my heart. Dearest, how are you? I'm trying very hard to be worthy of you during this very difficult and painful period you are going through. You see, Lenny, when I received the letter from you that you were hurt, it took all my assuredness out from under me, and I broke down and cried as I haven't for a long time. I guess all the accumulated months of tension were all released. Now, of course, since I've had more mail from you and I know more of the details, I'm back on my feet again, and I'm trying to do you proud. I received the telegram from the War Department this morning. As I read it, I was more and more grateful that I had your mail first. This is what it says. Regret, regret to inform you that your husband, PFC Leo Miller, was seriously wounded in action, 21 Jan, in Belgium. Mail address follows direct from hospital with details. At least they're honest. Last time they said slightly wounded. Diana. February 9th. Lenny, dear, I received two letters from you today. A V-mail from 1 slash 28 and an airmail from 1 slash 22. The airmail is the one you wrote right after you were wounded. I got the V-mail before the airmail. Here you wrote how it happened. It is sure noticeable that you wrote it on your back. It looks like the first letter I sent you from the hospital after Betty Lou was born. Diana. February 23. Dearest love, they saved me the piece of shrapnel which Doc excavated from behind my ear in a piece of gauze. But not knowing, I used it for a handkerchief when I lost it. <laughs> anyway, the spot feels much better without the fragment of metal in it. March 3, Dear Diana, although I have been in the hospital much longer now than either the time of Shelby or France, it doesn't seem as long as either of those times. Of course, then I was a rookie in Shelby, eager and ambitious in France, impatient to do my job. Now I'm a weary veteran who finds altogether too many memories crowding into his thoughts whenever he tries to just lie back and relax. Later, I see in tonight's Stars and Stripes that my 30th Division is in Germany again, has some towns of civilians on its hands. As you can understand, that my bed has suddenly become very constricting. Oh well, the lame lameness in my left arm is rapidly disappearing. Maybe I ought to try out for a baseball team now that spring is in the air. Lenny. March 16th. Dearest Lenny, I am so excited that I can't think straight. I had a postcard from the government today dated March 10th saying that you are convalescing and evacuated to the USA. Darling, is it true? I hope to hear from you shortly in the US and maybe even see you. Of course, I let your mother know immediately. 
are you really coming home, Diana? Lenny returns to the United States to a hospital in Massachusetts. He and Diana continue to write daily letters, and Diana is able to visit him once a month when her mom can take care of Betty in Brooklyn. August 14, 1945. Darling Diana, the war is over. Cheers and laughter resound through the corridors from ward to ward as the Truman announcement makes it official. There are some battles still to be fought. Franco must go. China must be freed from within, but the war for survival has ended with the people surging forward everywhere. Somebody's banging pots and pans in another ward. It's a great moment. The guns go silent for the first moment since the afternoon of September 18, 1931, when we were kids in school. I remember reading the headlines of the Franco Rebellion when I heard Chamberlain declare he was going to war on Hitler. The invasion of the USSR and Pearl Harbor and a long trail of blood through the years. And at the end of the trail, Mussolini dead, Hitler dead, or a fugitive, Hirohito, a prisoner of war. It is good to be alive this day. Lenny. Lenny remains in the hospital for over a year, recovering from experimental surgery. He was awarded the Silver Star and several other honors. June 1946. Lenny is released from the hospital. He is honorably discharged from the Army and returns home to Brooklyn. June 15, Dinenka. I've got a powerful desire to make this the last letter between us for a long, long time. When I phoned you yesterday, I told you not to write here, and if they send me to Halloran, which begins to seem likely, not that it hardly matters, I'd rather phone you during the first few, very few, let's hope, days that I shall be here. And then, from furlough and discharge to be with you always, and no need for letters, especially for such unhappy letters as the past year. All my love to my two girls. Perhaps I can phone you from New York <coughs> tomorrow. I hope so. Lenny. Sophie and um, David, thank you so much. Thank you. And I want to invite to the floor um, Liz Fox, Amy Fox, David, and our wonderful moderator, uh, film director Lisa Addis, who will tell you more about her work too. Thank you all. Wow, that was a wonderful reading, both of you. I love this book, um, and you really brought it to life. It just, it was amazing. Um, Sophie and David, really wonderful. Um, I am Lisa Addis. I produced and directed a film recently that actually the New York premiere was right here, and we did some research uh, at the American Jewish uh, Historical Society. The film is called G.I. Jews, Jewish Americans in World War II. And it was on PBS in April. Um, so I'm delighted to be here and uh, get to talk to you all. I've, let me uh, read your uh, bios to introduce you first. Elizabeth Fox has served for more than 20 years in a leadership role on the National Board of Hadassah, where her responsibilities include writing, training, and public speaking. We went to war to destroy the Nazis. That was... Sorry. 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 We're going to show a clip to the Participated in World War II. Amy Fox is an acclaimed screenwriter, playwright, and educator, and a passionate advocate for elevating women's voices in the arts and the workplace. Most recently, she wrote the screenplay for Equity, the female-driven Wall Street film. 
which premiered at Sundance in 2016 and was released by Sony Pictures Classics, Amy's previous feature screenplay for the Merchant Ivory film Heights. Uh, also, um, is a wonderful film. Amy teaches, I do the same thing, and they read my bio, I always say, no, it's not enough. Amy teaches screenwriting at NYU's graduate film program. Um, David, our wonderful Lenny tonight, has worked for Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Paul Greengrass, Sean Levy, Robert stop, Zemeckis. Stop, stop. <laughs> stop. See, this ain't the same thing. Stop, stop. <laughs> and many more. He's flirted with Julia Roberts, <laughs> stolen Tom Cruise's wife, berated Brooke Shields, married and divorced Deborah Messing, and snubbed Sarah, Jessica, and Mr. Pig. <laughs> um, so they want to show a quick clip from G.I. Jews, also a celebration of Jewish Americans in World War II, and uh, this is our two minute trailer, and we will start our Q&A. We went to war to destroy the Nazis. That was a mission for all of us. We went to war to save the world. The rumors were in the Jewish community that Jews were being slaughtered and something had to be done about it. They were fighting a people that were trying to destroy the Jewish people from the face of the earth. Right before D-Day, they told us Two out of three of you are not coming back. I decided to draw a huge star of David on the back of my field jacket. I had to let the Germans know where I was coming from. Across the barracks, I hear this voice, Rana, Rana. It was one of these anti-Semitic blondies from Louisiana. And he said, you a Jew. You and you, I says, yes, as a matter of fact, why do you ask? <laughs> My fellow soldiers wanted to know how on earth did you wind up on the front lines? You're Jewish. I said, because I wanted to be there. Suddenly I heard, you know, you have to say something good about Hitler. You know, he got rid of all the Jews. And I said, well, you didn't get this one. Entering that camp was the most horrific sight I've ever seen or ever hoped to see the rest of my life. I can never, ever forget. Today I come to you as a soldier in the American army and as a representative of the Jewish community of America. We were there for a reason, to reclaim who we were, and not to forget where we came from. That's why we went. So many themes in this film appear in the letters in your book. Um, and of course, Carl Reiner, uh, who was married during the war, was also separated from his wife. Um, his wife said the famous line, and when Harry met Sally, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> and he kept boxes and boxes of letters, hundreds that they wrote, sometimes two, three, four times a day. I know that everyone wants to know, how did you discover the letters? What did you know about them? And can you give us a little background about how this project came to be? Sure, sure. So, um, I don't know when I first became aware of the letters, but they were in a carton. They had been put away by my mom, who chose never to look at them because she always said they reminded her of a really painful time. And so they sat on the top of the shelf in the linen closet in the apartment for years and years. And eventually, when my mom, my dad passed away first, and then my mom passed away, and my brother and I, and my brother is here, were cleaning out the apartment. And um, kind of jokingly, Fred said to me, I'll take the medals and you take the letters. And that was okay. 
So the letters came home to my house in Colorado, and then they sat in my house for a long time. And as Amy referred to earlier, I kept saying to her, you're the writer, you need to write something about the letters. And it wasn't a priority, it wasn't a priority. At a certain point, <laughs> I just thought, you know what, I need to do something. And so I wasn't really, when I started to read them, it was really just reading them. And as I read them, I thought, these are really interesting. I mean, first I thought they'd be great for the family. And then as I kept reading them and I shared them with some friends, they said to me, this is really more than for the family. You really need to tell the story. And that's kind of how it came out. Amy, I know this project is personal for you as well. These are your grandparents. But I'm wondering, as a writer and a filmmaker, what's, what is the story of, of these letters? What jumped out to you in terms of, you know, the narrative of their story? Well, I'm just really glad I had the chance to work, to um, develop the script for tonight because it allowed me to relate to the letters in my own way. Um, and so I, you know, I really wanted to capture the scope of this journey that these two people went through. Um, from the training, you know, for him to going overseas to the hospitalization and, and for her, um, going from working for the war effort to the decision to have a baby to becoming a mom on her own. Um, you know, so I was trying to find a way to do that while also highlighting some of the moments that really did stand out to me. I mean, I think just given, I think these moments rang really true in here tonight, but so many references to um, just the the level of commitment, you know, and, and the sense that of what you are called to do um, you know, when he talks about not, like, having an uneasy conscience for not doing enough, I mean, I think we're all probably doing that right now. Um, when he talks about meeting people that said, oh, we, we, you know, we didn't like the Nazis, and he says, did you, you know, did you do anything? No, they couldn't point to anything they did to stop them. So, some of those contemporary resonances were really, really important to me, um, as well as just capturing kind of the spirit of, um, I knew my grandparents as, older people, but I didn't actually have any sense of just how resilient they were until I read these letters. David, you really brought Lenny to life. I mean, it was just incredible. Do you do you have a, any personal connection to the war, to family, or? I do, funny you should ask that. First, I just want to say Sophie, I thought Sophie was great. I've known Sophie a long time, and she was wonderful, and she had to run out, I think actually to like another performance or something, so don't, don't take her absence personally. <laughs> Let it be known that we mentioned her and we imagined her. Um, uh, you know, the universe has a way of kind of putting things in your path at the right time, um, even if they seem like the wrong things at the time, um, which is very interesting for me to reading the letters. Um, I, all my life, uh, my father died when I was a boy. He died when I was six. He had a heart attack. He was dead in the back of the ambulance. It was the most sudden thing anyone could ever think of. And my older brother and sister and I um, didn't talk much about his service in the war, but I knew he was in the war. I have his dog tags, and um, I don't know why. Maybe it was because I grew up watching Magnum P.I., but I told everyone my father was in the Korean War. Um, recently, uh, it's a short story, I promise. Recently, I went down to the Veterans Affairs office in downtown Manhattan to talk about my mom and some spousal benefits from veterans. And uh, the man behind the counter came out and shook my hand and said, congratulations, and I said, what? And he said, uh, your father was served in World War II. And I said, no, no, it's Korea. And he said, no, you're not telling me. I have the papers right here. It was World War II. Um, and so that was, I think, just a few months ago. And then Amy said, hey, do you want to read these letters? It was about your grandparents in World War II. I said, come on. So uh, there's no such thing as coincidence. So yes, I do have a personal connection. And reading this was so uh, such a gift to me. And a lot of times, as an artist, you you know certainly want to be of service to whatever it is you're reading. Um, but thank you. It really was a gift to me. I felt very close to my father reading it. I, I could imagine a little bit more what it, things must have been like for him. And I, that's just an area of his life I've never even you know now, forty something years later, I've never even thought. I've never really thought of in that way. And um, I jumped at the chance, and the letters are just the whole thing was spectacular. So I'm just happy. To so Liz, um, you, 
You were the furlough baby yeah. that they referred to. Yeah. So you discover this material and you get a glimpse into the lives and thoughts of your parents in a way that most people don't have the opportunity to. What did you learn that was, I know you learned a lot, but what did you learn that was the most striking or surprising or moving from these letters? Oh, I guess I guess I learned a lot, a great deal, and in some cases more than I wanted to know. There's certain letters that weren't in the book. <laughs> More than you want to know about your parents' lives. Um, but not more than you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, that's what will make the movie version already. Right? Yeah. So but I think, I think that, and I have to sort of uh, reiterate what Amy said, I think that the level of commitment and the depth of commitment and the belief in making the world a better place for everyone, for all humanity, there's lots of references. We, you know, we couldn't put everything in the script, and there's a whole lot of references to my dad's reaction to experiencing segregation in the South. And they went on to fight against uh, housing discrimination in New York City and changing the laws so that blacks could live among whites. And so it's, it's that kind of, um, I guess, passion and commitment that was more tempered later in life as I you know, remember them as parents. And so I think reading that to me really struck me as being exceptional. Yeah, I noticed that as well from the letters, the um, sense of justice and racial and religious equality. Um, he wrote a great deal about segregation in the South. Uh, you know, a lot of servicemen from the North had never seen racial segregation and clearly it was very disturbing. Um, but beyond that, he was really poetic about his uh, beliefs. And I'm wondering, you know, here we are at the Center for Jewish History. What's Jewish about their story and their point of view and their experience? Are there Jewish values and themes that come through in the letters? Yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure, there are Jewish values and themes. Uh, my dad came from an Orthodox family. My mom came from a more traditional, more Yiddish kind, kind of a family. Um, my, once my dad's left, my mom continues to go to my grandparents' every Shabbos for the Friday night dinner. And um, there's lots of references on my dad's part of participating in services and talking to rabbis and, and connecting with his Jewish roots when he was overseas, both in, in Mississippi and then when he was overseas. And um, once he's, after he was wounded, a rabbi came and visited him, and that was very meaningful. And I think, I think a lot of their sense of justice and equality and, and humanity comes from their, their Jewish values. Yeah, I, I noticed in, also in your trailer um, that sense of there was a really beautiful line about, like, we, we knew what we were fighting for. And, and there are also in the letters a lot of references to my grandfather educating other soldiers. Like when he makes that joke about the squibs aspirin, it was it was really upsetting to him that the soldiers were not being motivated to fight the fight that he knew they were fighting and that people were a little bit disconnected from what the war was all about. And so he, he really took that very personally, I think. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the line that you read in one of the letters about, um, you know, I know I promised I would, I, I was going to come home, I don't know if I can keep that promise, and that the most important thing to him was to fight Hitler, even more important than his own life, and I mean, that's really powerful stuff. I'll just add to that, because he enlisted, and he was older than the typical soldier. Mm. He was 27 when he enlisted. And what took him so long is that he was a union organizer. And the union, he was working for the New York City Welfare Department, and the union didn't want him to go. And he finally gets to a point where he just says, I've got to go, needless. And he had very bad eyesight. And so in order to make sure he would get into the infantry, he memorized the eye chart. That's a true story. Wow. So another thing that I really noticed um, from these letters, and you know, Sophie brought your grandmother to life so beautifully, and she was so vivid. Um, 
I had a lot of trouble in my research finding material about women, finding women who wanted to speak about their experience. And um, and your mother's letters really depict the female experience in a way that I just haven't really heard before. Um, it's not the women on the home front in the factory and just, you know, victory gardens and rationing stockings. You know, there's, there's a great deal of death. I'm wondering, Amy, if you can talk about, um, you know, what's new in this material and, and how did you feel about uncovering that story? Well, I think that was one of the things um, that was really important to both of us. And, and the interesting thing is that my grandfather had to save the letters from her, aside from the ones that he burned, and he would save them, I think, in his gas mask, is that right? Um, a lot of soldiers weren't able to do that or didn't do that, so most collections of World War II letters that exist are only from the soldier's perspective. So that was one of the things my mom knew she had that was really different and really special, was that she had both sides. Um, and for me, it was just really interesting, because I do, you know, I'm, I, um, I really am a fighter every day for women's stories, and I did think that, you know, we, we have sort of heard of the soldier's narrative and the soldier's letters home, and I, I knew I had never seen it from the other side, so it was really important that for both of us, I think, that that be brought out. Right, and you really feel what it was like in a way that is really intimate to have a baby while your husband is overseas. It's I will just say there's, there's quite a bit about her working in the factory before she right. stops. And just one story, and we couldn't put everything in the letters, but one story is one afternoon she goes to work after lunch, and there's this horrific smell around her, her machine, the milling machine that she's working on, and she, she doesn't know what's going on. It's really making her sick. And she goes to lie down a couple of hours later. She feels better. She comes back to the machine, and she realizes that some of the fellow uh, co-workers, some of the men who were not eager to have women working alongside of them, and these were older men who were not, you know, going off to war, and they had spread Limburger cheese, which has a real strong odor, on the electrolyte, electric light above the machine, and so when she turned it on, it got hot and melted, and it was just this horrendous smell. And there are a couple of other examples similarly where they didn't, they really didn't welcome the women in the shop at that time. Mm -hmm. But she was involved in union activities? Yes. Yeah, she wanted, yeah, she was involved in trying to get her un, a union started in her shop. There was a lot of intimidation. There was a lot of um, activity against creating a union, but uh, she and some others persevered and they did unionize the shop. Do you want to talk a little bit about what they did after the war? Because they continued to be active politically. They didn't just talk the talk, you know? Um, so after the war, my grandparents uh, got an apartment in Stuyvesant Town, which had been built for veterans specifically. Um, and when they uh, moved in, MetLife owned the had developed the property, and the official policy was that it was whites only. And MetLife had another building in Harlem, and it was basically segregation. They had a complex for white tenants and a complex for black tenants, and in both cases only for veterans. Um, and so my grandparents joined a committee uh, that had a sort of core group of about 25 people, and I think had signatories of about 2,000 throughout Stuyvesant Town who were committed to fighting that rule. Um, and I wrote a screenplay about it, <laughs> which is why she handed me the microphone. Um, and, uh, and so they fought that battle and actually did did win and did change the policy um, and were nearly evicted in the process. Um, and they really, you know, I think that was probably like one of the more dramatic episodes. Um, but I have found, I the past couple of years for me, I've become much more of an activist, which I think I also was in my, in much more as a teenager. And I feel very connected, reading these letters, I just feel very connected to like a larger sense of, of who they were. I want to turn, uh, open this up for uh, questions. So, um, is there a mic? Yeah. That travel? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, could you explain the, uh, 
the references to his uh, being a translator? Oh, so, yeah, so, so my dad was what's called a scout. He would go ahead with the offices to speak with the underground, connect with the people in the local areas. And he, he spoke, in, obviously spoke English. He knew Yiddish. He had studied French. He was quite fluent in French. From, and he had a facility with languages. So from the Yiddish, he picked up German. He actually studied German when he was in basic training to prepare. He also picked up some Flemish and some Belgian. So he was fairly fluent and was able to connect in a way that the, many of the other soldiers were not. I was taken so much by the understatement uh, of his experiences as he wrote of them both in Mississippi and in, in Europe. Uh, one of the Mississippi questions, because he came to it so often, was why he never got promoted. I, have, I would guess, am I guessing correctly? Yeah, you're right. Um, th that's become a favorite co uh, question. Pretty much it's asked every time I speak, and I've been doing a number of these, of these talks in the last month. Um, I don't have a direct answer. Indirectly, there's sort of an undercurrent through the letters which made me feel like he felt he was passed over because he was Jewish. And I actually put a footnote into the book in which I, I talk about that. Um, there was no reason. He was called upon to teach classes. He did all kinds of things that were way beyond what a private does, and yet he, he didn't really get promoted. So you can draw your own conclusion, as I have. Thank you. I, I love this. I thought it was great. I wanted to know about the burning of the letters, what the situation was, if you could reveal that. Okay. So, so my dad was a historian, and he was really committed to bringing back, to sending back every letter so that he would have the document on both sides. When he was in danger of being captured, and there were several times when that happened, he would burn whatever letters he still had with him. And also, there were a few times where he burned photos. He had pictures of my mom and of me. And it was only when he was in fear of being captured. And as I understand it, it was really just a few letters that ended up not coming back. He didn't want them. He didn't want them to. If he was captured, he didn't want them to have the letters with the addresses and the names and the pictures. And it was just protection of the family as a Jewish person. And, uh, I have a documentary called uh, Dying to Live about my cousin that I've been working on who escaped the Warsaw Ghetto in the early days and uh, came to London to tell people what was going on and nobody believed them. And your story of your, I can just imagine you going through that story of hearing your, these letters and, and empathizing with the struggle that they were having. Is there anything we could learn from that? What do you want us to walk away thinking about? I, I think what I would like you to walk away with is, is a commitment to follow your own beliefs and your own, what, what you think is important, and not be afraid. I'm very loud. Uh, I have two questions about your father. Yeah. Um, how old were you when he first saw you? So he came back to the States when I was eight months old. And there's kind of a funny family story to that. You know, it was, it was wartime, so there was no gas. People didn't have cars. Cars were up on blocks. And my dad was brought to Staten Island, and my mom and I were in Brooklyn, in East New York. And how do you get from East New York to Staten Island at that time? My grandfather had a friend who owned a funeral parlor. And they <laughs> took us to see my dad in the funeral parlor car. And, well, it wasn't their cars, it was the car that took me on the So, so that, was, that was the first time, and it was a brief visit, a couple of hours, and then he didn't come home till I was 18 months old. 
And again, the family story is that here was this strange man all of a sudden taking my mom's attention, and I was obviously quite resentful and not very happy, and it did take a while. And I have a friend whose dad was uh, in the English Army in Britain and had a very similar experience. She shared with me that her dad also came home when she was almost two years old, and she really didn't react very well, and that's kind of, kind of what happened. What about the convalescent? Really long convalescence, yes. the experimental surgery. Yes. Did your father come back bionic? <laughs> no, because it, it, like <laughs> it was actually early skin grafting, which was new. And one of the reasons that he fared so well is that penicillin was new also. And he got a lot of penicillin. Um, the, the actual story of the surgery was written up in Life magazine, and I have a copy of it, and it's the most graphic series of pictures of the actual surgeries, because they were done on a series of men, and there were only a few for whom it was successful. My dad just wanted to. Thank you. No, he was lucky. That's presentation was such an eye-opener for me, and I think particularly because I'm a child of survivors, my father survived Auschwitz, my mother survived numerous camps, she's still alive, and I never really had the, this perspective of what the American Jews were going through. My whole experience has been what the uh, Holocaust, you know, the victims, the survivors went through. This was tremendous for me, it had such a huge impact on me. Well, so many Jewish Americans also had family uh, in Europe, in Eastern Europe. I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, Diana and Lenny's families and what happened to them. Yeah, so they, they both had family in Europe. My dad had more family in Europe at that point. And as he is meeting people who are um, coming from further in the east, He's asking all along the way, do you know, do you know anybody from the town? The town was called Dovermeal that he was concerned about. And he kept asking people, do you have any news of Dovermeal? And, and once or twice he did get news of it. Um, so yes, he was very concerned. He knew that he had family and close family. And a lot of them did perish, as many other Jews did. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have, you have, uh, I'm Liz's cousin, and for me, meeting it, besides the historical part, was seeing my aunt and uncle in a very different way. I love the way they address each other romantically. Um, I always, I always had the um, feeling that my aunt and uncle were very, very committed to each other. I'm not sure why. I guess I just got that sense from being with them. But after reading this, you know, I, you know, I, I saw that commitment. And um, also, on a personal note, it's a lot of fun to see family names in there who I know. <laughs> so. Uh, so, but it's it's just a joy to read, and I've been talking it up with all my friends. So, um, <laughs> and, I, just, I just wanted to say one thing, which is I, I loved how strong your mom, your grandma, was because you know to your point, my dad was also a, an Auschwitz survivor, and I always heard it from that perspective. But what I loved, other than everything about the reading, is your grandmother who was, she was a very strong woman, and it was, while she was afraid, it didn't stop her. You know, I love the stories of when she brings you home, and you know, it's like any one of us who have children, it's like, what do you, you know, they don't follow the instructions, so what do you do? And her husband was away, and she was worried about him, worried about the world, worried about her family, and yet she was able to, to keep it, as she said, in one little place in her heart so she could move forward. And to me, you know, that, that's, it's wonderful to see strong women who are smart who can move forward and the, the difference. She's a great role, role model, so that touch. I appreciate that comment. Um, 
So, um, before I thank everyone for this wonderful program, I want to invite you to stay, hang out, have some refreshments, but also buy the book, because uh, Liz is going to, uh, to sign it. So there's a table right here behind the wall, and please feel free to hang out. And I want to thank Lisa, Amy, Liz, David, and Sophie so much, and thank you all for coming. And our next, our next program is also a Fox. It's about William Fox from Fox Movies. It's next week, the man who made the movies, um, a book talk. So I hope to see you. Thanks so much.